If you brought your Bibles, uh, turn with me into the book of Job. The book of Job, chapter 22. Chapter 22. The keynote address at any convention is usually intended to sort of hopefully start the convention in the right direction. And if it's just a matter, if we come to a convention, just a matter of getting away from home and spending money, coming to beautiful Southern California. It's kind of pretty out today, isn't it? But uh, you'll be tasting the air and seeing it by the end of the week, like by the end of the convention. Uh, yesterday, we could see the mountains beautifully. Today, not quite so clear. And by the end of the week, we'll be looking at that brown cloud again where the mountains used to be. <clears throat> but it's good to be alive anyway, whether the weather's good or whether it's bad. And uh, if we go to the northwest and it's raining, they don't mind it. We do. It's now it's raining again. See? That's what makes the northwest. If it didn't rain, we wouldn't have the horse. We wouldn't have the beauty. The Northwest. So we'll take that as it comes and goes. But we come to a convention uh, for help. But there, is an, uh, there is an honest preacher here today. If he's honest, he won't say, I need help. I need help. I've got problems. Once in a while, somebody won't admit it, I know one not aware of it. <clears throat> I remember my brother O.C. came back to the Middle West years ago, and I think it was Topeka, Kansas. Uh, he was there in the tent, in a, in a, had a tent meeting up. They were running for the summer, and he was there for a couple of weeks uh, as the speaker, the evangelist. And uh, we drove over on the weekend, and he was preaching on a Sunday afternoon on divine healing. He announced it, and uh, that was some years ago, and uh, it was a, a new message, divine healing. Everybody was interested, and the tent was full. There were 1,200 people there, and right in the middle of, the, of his message, my brother O.C. said, uh, I dare there isn't one physically sound person in this audience. There's perhaps 1,200 people here, and not one sound person, physically sound person in the house. And a man about 40 years old stood up in the middle of that tent, stood to his feet as tall as he was. And uh, my brother said, sir, are you accepting my challenge? Yes, sir. Well, sir, what's happened to your hair? There wasn't a hair on his head. His head was shining like a bowling ball. Wife. And that man sat back down easy and slumped down more and more and more. <laughs> so finally, I think he was under the seats. You couldn't see you. He was sure he was physically sound while he was bald headed. So there may be, and there could be someone like that in the cave. I don't know. We're here to get help. And I'm the first man to admit it. So I've been preaching now for 46 years. I'm the first man to feel I, I'm on the way over here. I told the folks in the car that uh, 
I feel that I, 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 I think I had perhaps a successful ministry. I like to say I, my ministry as a pastor was successful. And yet I'm the first man to feel today that I shortchanged the people for perhaps 40 years. The good can become the enemy of the best. Well, I thought what I was telling him was good. I don't believe I was given him the best. And so I would like for you to follow me today going to be difficult for me to, to express. I am with my limited education and use of the English language. I find it difficult at times to find myself at a loss to express what I feel. And so if you'll bear with me in that way and, and try to grasp what I have to say, I believe you'll go home richer as a pastor. Job, <clears throat> chapter 22, verse 21. Acquaint now thyself with him. Eliphaz is talking, one of Job's philosopher friends, the oldest one of the group, in fact. And he says to Job after his argument, and this is his final appeal to Job. For 21 chapters here, his friends have been debating with him and arguing with him and disputing with him. And he has uh, argued them down to us. He's brought them to a standstill. And his friend Eliphas makes his final appeal to him in these words. And he's talking about God. Verse 17. Now, see, he's talking about God, and he says, Job, acquaint now thyself with him, with God, and be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. Father, add your blessing to this Old Testament passage, and enrich it to our thinking and our hearts. Help us to preach. We need your help. And help the people to listen, for that can be so difficult at times, even tiring and boring. But help them, Lord. Give them the grace of receptivity. We'll give you the praise for everything's accomplished, for we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. <coughs> Eliphas was one of the philosopher friends, the oldest one, and he's been arguing with Job and seeing they were getting nowhere. And somewhere and from somewhere, Eliphas got a hold of a hot wire. And he really becomes a, a New Testament evangelist for a moment. And I can visualize him moving in closer to his friend Job and lowering his voice, fully aware of Job's suffering and grief. And this is what he says. Job, your problem really boils down to this fact that your knowledge of God is quite limited. Now, I softened it a bit more than it reads here. 
What he was actually saying here in the text was, oh, your problem boiled down to this fact that you don't know God. You know about him. And your argument has proved that. But you convinced all the Jerusalem. And there are three very important words in the text, and they're all related. In the first verse we read, acquaint now thyself with him, with God, and be at peace. That's what you're looking for, is peace. Get acquainted with God, and you'll have peace. Because there's something marvelous, something wonderful about God that necessarily brings peace to everybody that knows him. And then he said, you won't have to start looking for good. Good things will come. So think of that. A point, peace, and good. You know, there's a, there's a vast difference in uh, being acquainted with someone and just knowing their name, knowing about them. Job, your problem is that you know about God, but you're not acquainted with him. You can be introduced to someone. This is Pastor Lee W. Robinson. He is the pastor of our church in Panorama City. And uh, if anyone, I have uh, his biography here, his life story. and. Uh, uh, we're selling this for 50 cents a piece. Everybody ought to have one to learn about this wonderful man. So you've learned his name. You've been introduced to him. Now you're going to read his biography. But if you've ever read anyone's biography, the part that they didn't put in the book is the most important part. You've had an introduction, you've learned his name, now you're going to read his life story. But you're still are not acquainted with him. You're not acquainted with him. There is, you don't really know him. You know about him. You know how old he is. You know where he was born. You have all this information about him. But when you get acquainted with him, that's what you know. And that is what Eliphaz is telling Job. And that is why I say that I believe in my ministry. It was weakened by the fact that I started at the wrong end every time I preached. Every time I talked to some man and witnessed to some man and testified to some man, on a one-to-one -one basis, I started at the wrong end because I started with man. And every time I preached, I talked about the man, the man, the sinner. The man, because he's a sinner, and I would quote, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's you, my brother, my sister. And the way to the that sin is death. You're hell bound unless you get saved.
And if I could promise him anything, I would promise him this. Second Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. And the things you used to do, the drink and smoke and cuss and lie and I still haven't told him a thing you didn't know. The man knew he was a sinner, and he knew that hell was made for sinners. I hadn't told him a thing. And then I promised him, if he'd get saved, Jesus was the Savior. I'm the door. Who wants the door? I never told him about something that was behind the door. You know where Jesus started and where the apostles started? Not with man. They started with God. I started with man. They started with God. They had something to tell the sinner that he didn't know. He never thought of. They started with God. I took Strong's exhaustive concordance. It gives it a reference for every word in the Bible, every time it's mentioned. And I took the four Gospels and made a marvelous discovery. Jesus talked about sin, sinners, and singing, sinning, exactly 12 times in the four Gospels. But he referred to his heavenly Father 170 times in the four Gospels. Hallelujah. Why waste his time talking about something that the man already knew, the sinner already knew? I call him wasting his time. A hundred and seventy. I promised them that they could come in and become a part of the sheep, one of the Lord sheep. But they were not. Jesus was only the shepherd. The shepherd doesn't own the sheep. He only looks after the sheep. He don't own them. Nobody else owns them. I got the people to come into the sheep, into the, into the herd, all right. And I never told them that God was their owner, that he owned the flock. I spent all my time talking about the shepherd Jesus. And then I, I, I brought them into the epistles and I, I said, you're stones in the temple. You're the temple of God. And I had them as stones in the temple. And then I brought them into the great family of God. Oh, what a pleasure to be a part of the family of God. Now that was all good preaching, and that was good gospel, but it wasn't good enough. Because when they really needed their brothers and sisters that they'd leaned on on Sunday and loved on Sunday and made so much about on Sunday in church, here we are together in the family of God, a blessing to be in the family of God. On Monday morning they went to work and the devil met him on the job and said, hi. 
her mother said, where's my brothers and sisters? Where's my brothers and sisters? And they were scattered too. Whereas the stones in the temple that I leaned on yesterday on Sunday People need something more than brothers and sisters who can only sympathize with them when they're in trouble. That's good for Sunday. It's good to know that there are others who are with a lot of people in the same, going through the same boat. And the apostles knew that when they said, There is no temptation taken you, but as such as is common to man. I mean, brother, it's hard to stand alone if you're just leaning on the brothers and sisters. The arm of flesh will fail you. <clears throat> I gave them 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And I stop there. You can be a new man, have new appetites, new aspirations, new friends. But look what the apostle said. In the following verses. 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. And all things are of God. And he passes Jesus up there and says, All things are of God. Who hath reconciled us unto Jesus? No, no, no. Reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. What is it? The same reconciliation to God. I'm to point men and women, when they get saved, to point them to the fatherhood of God. With Jesus as the door. With Jesus as the gate, with Jesus as the shepherd, but with God as their father. These men, beginning with Jesus, stress the fatherhood of God. And I'm going to try to, to tell you from the scriptures what a difference it makes when you discover that you are a son and a daughter of Almighty God through faith in Jesus Christ. Having brothers and sisters down here, it's wonderful to know that you are my brother and sister and that you can sympathize with me. And you did it when I needed some, some consolation and some help. I was in the hospital. Uh, cards came by the scores. Sympathy cards, sympathy cards, assuring me that you were praying for me. But that only said, well, as some other folks are thinking about me. If I hadn't had a hold of somebody that could do more than think about me, or sympathize with me, or send me a sympathy card, and write comforting words, and send me comforting poems, and send, and send, and send me uh, fragrant flowers and bouquets, I have something better than that. And has given us this ministry of reconciliation to it, that God. See how they began with God? They started with God. The whole problem started with God. Although no, God is angry with those sinners. God is angry with you. It's only Jesus that takes a hold of God's hand and says, I'll die for them. I intercede for them. And then God 
uh, God stands on one in one hand of Jesus and the sinner in the other hand of Jesus and Jesus is pleading and finally Jesus succeeds and oh God's wrath is not born. That's hogwash. It was God's love that sent Jesus into the world. Salvation didn't begin with Jesus. It began with the longing, wounded, grieving, weeping heart of a perfect God whose children had gone astray. And it was God's love that sent Jesus into the world. To it that God was in Christ reconciling himself, the world unto himself. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Oh, I don't know how many sermons I preached on the prodigal son. I wish I could take everyone up back. We missed it when we called that the parable of the prodigal son. It was not the parable of the prodigal son. It's the parable of a grieving God, a perfect, loving God. Both of those boys were prodigals. Jesus starts it out by saying there's a certain man. He doesn't say there's a certain boy. He said there's a certain man, man, who had two sons. The younger said unto his father, Give me the portion that falleth to me. The father is a perfect father. Divided unto them his living. And the younger son went out for a few days and wasted the money his father gave him. A prodigal is a waster of good things. He wasted his money. But the older boy who stayed at home, his waste was a greater loss. He wasted his sonship. For when he complained about the young brother's return, listen to what the father said. Verse 31. Luke 15, 31. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. If you chose to be another hired hand, you did it. You could have killed every kid in the block and every calf in the herd. And entertain the whole county if you wanted to, for sure. No, all you saw was a hard-working servant that you've been. Just another one of the hired hands. He wasted his sonship. And when the, what we call the prodigal son, came home, I'm going back and I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of the hired servants. He got back. How do I know the parable is the parable of the father? Because he said, thou art ever with me. And while the boy was out in the far country, throwing his money away and ruining his health, he was still in the father's heart. The father thought of him every day. Grieved over his loss every day. Prayed for him every day. Anticipated his return every day because he looked down the trail every morning and said he's coming home one day. The training he got is not wasted in vain. He's going to get tired of the pig pen and give him a permanent wave. And he's coming home. And when the boy came home, the father saw him while he was a great way off before he saw home. The father saw him. How come? Because he looked down the road every morning, expecting him home that day. 
Sinner, look what you're doing to God. Look what you're doing to your Creator. Look what you're doing to your Father. When he came home and said, Father, after the Father had ran out, the only time I see God in a hurry ever, is when this boy is coming home. Father runs out to meet him and falls on his neck and says, Papa, Father, I've, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm not worthy to be called a son. And lots of time, a hand went over his mouth and the father said, hey, that's enough. He doesn't want to be a son. Um, um, go out and get the best hired hands Jeans and overalls and pimp overalls and give him leather, leather hand gloves to work with. Oh, no, no, no. You're not to be a servant. You're a son. A son. Get the best robe. Put the ring back on his finger. The covenant seal. Put shoes on his feet. This, my son, is now going to be a servant? No, no, no. A son. And this elder brother was also a son, but he was being a hired hand, a servant. Good choice. Maybe he was one of Harms's members of Harms's church who preached serving the Lord. Working for God and maybe getting a hamburger for it. All wash. He came to his own. John 1.11 said he came unto his own and his own received him not. But to as many as did receive him, to them gave he the power to become the servants of God. No, no, no. Become the son. Sons of God, beloved in Jesus. Oh, what wondrous words of grace. In his Son, the Father sees us. And as sons, he gives us a place. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know what we shall appear. We shall be like him. Oh, we shall see. The songwriter preached more gospel in that song than I've preached in 40 years. Every parable, every miracle, every sermon Jesus preached. I challenge you to take your red, red, red letter testament. Follow the, the, the red printing. Every sermon, every miracle, every parable, Jesus spoke and uttered and miracle performed. Every one of them was pointing us to the fatherhood of God. Teach us to pray, said his disciples, as John taught his disciples to pray. How did he start it? After this manner. Our Father, which art in heaven. Brother, that's the whole prayer. Get the gist and the truth in those six words, and the other 60 words in the prayer are simply by way of explanation. The whole prayer is in those six words. For the power is not in the words. The power is in the truth. Fatherhood, God, our Father. That's the first consciousness that you need. That you're a son. That you're a daughter. But wait a minute. That doesn't impress me too much. And I'll tell you why. Because my father turned what should have been a hell, a home, into a hell. My father 
stole the roses, the, the roses from my mother's cheeks when she was in her twenties. My father taught five little boys how to drink and how to gamble and how to cuss and swear and lie and steal. Tell smutty stories. My father sent my mother to an early grave. She died in her fifties of a broken heart. So if I, when I think of our father, I think of the imperfections, the selfishness of an earthly father. And St. Paul knew that. He said, we had fathers after the flesh who beat us voluntarily after their own, for their own flesh, but not on the Lord. So Jesus qualified it when he said, our father, which art in heaven. He, he, by saying that, Jesus was not trying to locate God. He wasn't, he wasn't locating my father. He was describing him. Lest I liken God to my heavenly father, lest I liken him to John Harms, my earthly father. Heaven's the type of perfection, bliss. So, begin your prayer with an awareness that your Father is heavenly, perfect, ideal, and good. I don't need to pray any further. I've got it. I've got it. What more do I need to do? As you brothers and sisters of mine in the Lord, in this family of God, when I really need you, you're not around. You're, you're, you've got, you're wrestling with the same problems I am, alone somewhere. The devil's saying hi to you, too. But we sang a song in a few conventions back. He's always there when things go wrong. You're not, but he is. He's always there when my hope is gone. Get acquainted with him, Job said. Uh, uh, Elijah said, Job, get acquainted with him, and thou shalt be builded up. We know what it is to be torn down, don't we? You know what it is to be shattered. You know what it is to be almost destroyed, maybe. But he said, get acquainted with him, acquainted with God, on a one-to-one -one basis, a father-son, father-daughter basis. He's always there when things go wrong. He's always there when hope is gone. He lifts me up when I'm in prayer. He's always there. He's never gone. When I'm alone, he's always there. The fatherhood of God. John, Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said, Take no thought for what you shall wear eat. Those, those things, the Gentiles worry about those things. And your heavenly Father knows that you have need of those things. Don't pray for those things. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them. In the next chapter, chapter 7, he's talking on the same theme. He said, which of you, ma'am, your child would come and ask you for bread, fish, or egg. All those are necessities, aren't they? Good things. Am I right? Come on. Those are good things. Which of you, if he says bread, would you give him a stone? If he asked you for an egg, would you give him a centipede or a tarantula? 
Oh, no, no, no. If you, being carnal, human, evil even, he said, know how to give good things to your children, how much more, how much more, say it with me, how much more, come on, say it, how much more will your heavenly, your perfect, your ideal, your righteous, your holy, your loving, your devoted Father give good things to them that ask him? And he was quoting in that, he was perhaps quoting the gist of Psalm 8411. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. He will give grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from them who walk up. And then we come into, by chance, Jesus, by his example, he not only taught us to look to the fatherhood of God and to be aware of it, live under the fatherhood of God, he gave us the example. And this, to me, is the bell ringer. He has been, to this time, the prophet healer. There was the year of obscurity, the first year when he was getting acquainted. The second year of popularity when they couldn't accommodate the crowds. When he fed them 5,000 men, there were 14,000 people, or at least, beside the women and children, there were at least 14,000 he fed with the boys' box lunch. And the Bible says he had to be careful where he went. The crowds thronged, and if the crowds were sad sight. Then that year of opposition, when the prophet healer of Nazareth became the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. After he spent three years teaching us about the fatherhood of God, answering the question of the ages, what is God like? And Brother Crabtree gave us in the convention last year the question of Moses when he said, God, let me see your glory. Remember that? God said, I have a better plan. I can't show you. No man has ever seen God. No man ever will see God. God is a spirit. No man has seen God at any time. John chapter 1. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son of God. He hath been. He came to declare, to open up, to reveal what God was like. And Philip, after three years about, in the 14th of John, Philip said, just show us the Father. Philip, I can't do that. And the more than Moses can see him, you can't see his spirit. Even Adam didn't see God. Adam knew what it was to be acquainted with him in the garden. They never saw him. The Bible says Adam, while walking in the garden, heard the voice of God. He heard his voice. You don't have to see a person to be acquainted with them. Show us the Father. And Jesus said, for three years I've been showing you the Father. He didn't say he was the Father. That's what I've been here for, to show you the Father. If you've, if you've seen me, certainly you've seen the Father right along with me. I don't say anything that he doesn't tell me to say. I don't do a thing that he doesn't tell me to do. I don't go in a place for what he goes with me.
how he reaches that place of desperation when there's no more miracles. He never performed one in his own defense anyway. The devil tried to get him to command these stones to be bread. You're hungry after 40 days of fasting. And these stones in the Parker household. Well, not in his own defense. He didn't come from that. He came to show us how to live by faith. How to live under the guiding and protecting of loving hand of our Heavenly Father. And he's facing death. He really hasn't calculated on this. He really didn't know what he was facing when he said to the Father, I'll know. And the Father said, Son, you're going to have to go down and redeem lost humanity. For no man can by any means redeem his brother. Oh, for God to ransom for him. Son, you'll have to go. Oh, I don't know. If it's just a matter of dying physical death, he could do that all. But when he took all the condemnation for the sin of the world, for yours and mine, mine was enough to crush him alone. When he added them up for the sinners of the world, it made an old man out of him in a week. Isaiah saw him, this princely man, who was the acme of physical perfection. Isaiah saw him hanging on that cross, and he said, he wasn't much to look at. Your sins of mine have destroyed him. And in Gethsemane, he left those disciples who went to sleep. The Bible said he went over by a big rock. And he knelt down and he said, Abba, Abba, Father, what is that? What did he say? What does it mean? An intimacy that we haven't seen before because it's never needed. The nearness. Of Father, as it needed him now. For he wants to back out. Abba, Father, all things are possible with thee. If it's possible, uh, excuse me, uh, let this cup pass from me. But that Abba, what does it mean? It's a family circle title. It's a title that little children use. It's the equivalent to our daddy, our papa. It's made so real to me when my little granddaughter is in our house, two years old plus, and she's playing with the toys on the floor. What are you doing, uh, uh, tennis? I'm playing with my toys. And she's playing, she's the, the floor is messed up with toys. She's got a bag up in that big at our house. And she's in the middle of those toys. They're her playmates. There's dolls, two or three of them. There's uh, balls and there's beads and there's uh, what have you. And Garth comes in, my 23-year-old, her 23-year-old uncle Garth. And he likes to tease her. He comes in, I'm going to get you. And Tennis looks up at him with a, with, with a look of fright on her face. She says, Papa, that's me. Papa, Papa, Papa. And she kicks the toys out of the way and she runs and jumps in my arms. Papa, Papa, hold me. Papa, hold me. And then she looks at God and says, <laughs> She knows that. Jesus said, unless you accept the kingdom of God as, not like, as a little child. We're not to be childish. We're to be childlike. Well, how, do I, how have I preached that? Oh, little children, forgive each other. Little children, I'm going home. I'm never going to play with you again. But 
tomorrow they say, can you come over and play? The Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that's included and that's good. It's that Papa. Daddy. Holy. My daddy's rich. My daddy is the strongest. My daddy is the smartest. And he's still the smartest, though he might be the dumbest. But to that little child who's smartest. Daddy, how many people are living on the moon? I don't know. I don't know, son. Daddy, how many people are living on Mars? I don't know, son. Daddy, how are they making the atomic bomb? I don't know, son. But Daddy, you don't mind me asking, do you? Well, no. Well, how are you going to learn if you don't ask? <laughs> but he's still the smartest. My Daddy has all the answers. My Daddy is the strongest. He can whip your Daddy. My Daddy is the richest. Might be as poor as that Pentecostal preacher. The boys were talking one boy said, My dad's a lawyer. He makes fifty thousand dollars a year. The other boy said, My dad is a doctor. He makes a hundred thousand dollars a year. Preacher's boy, I'm saying anything. He said, What's your dad? Your dad's a preacher. How much he makes? I don't know how much he makes. I know it takes four men to carry it down to him. <laughs> when the family of God is scattered, and when the devil says hi, I'm going to get you. You familiarize yourself with the title that Jesus gave to his father, Abba, Daddy. Let your heavenly father be Daddy. Let him be Papa. And Paul, writing to the Galatians in Galatians 4, he said, and when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son into the world to redeem us who are under the law. And he said that we might become sons of God. And being sons, he has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, what? Daddy, Papa. He's brought us into an intimate relationship where our Heavenly Father, the perfect, almighty, perfect, righteous, loving, Heavenly Father, becomes to us Daddy, the richest, the strongest, the best, the most honest, the most loving. That childlike, simple, Confidence, faith, and a belief. I remember it just comes to me when our Dorothy was about nine or ten years old. One of his sisters had a birthday, and the mother baked a beautiful cake for them, had it ice, ready for the candles, and she had to go to the store to get the little candles to put in the cake. That was for either Barbara or Glenda. And Garth came home from school. And here, while she's at the store, here's this beautiful cake. Cakes are made to bake to eat. So Garth cuts a great big wedge out of this cake. And 
shortly after a mother comes. One person would do that, she knew. So she rounds him up. What in the world do you think you're doing? Why did you? Why did you? And she's about ready to give him a flogging. He said, why did I? Because I live in this house. And because I'm your son. <laughs> acquainted with his mother. <laughs> I don't know if I've helped you or not. But I've done this help. There's no people in the world. It's that old man upstairs. The man upstairs. And to Orthodox Jews, perhaps, he's the, the eternal. He's the almighty God. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. Did you know who he is? My heavenly father. He's all of that that they talked about. But he's my heavenly more than that, when I really need him, Job said in the next verse, he said, Receive, I pray thee, his word, thy, uh, his truth at his mouth. Receive, I pray thee. Is that the next verse? The truth at his mouth. On several occasions, there have been Oh, I know, I know it's good. It's good. It's not good enough for me. People have come to <clears throat> one very wonderful fellow phoned me one time and said, can I come and see you? I said, well, I'm just ready to get my coat on and ready to leave. I'm on an appointment. I can't see you this well, maybe, he said, uh, maybe maybe we could take care of it here. I feel maybe that you have a word from the Lord for me. And I said, well, yes, I do. Oh, fine. I said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, that, that wasn't what I meant. I said, well, that's what you got. That little girl, when she runs to me, Papa, there's no, no problem in communication. She doesn't even say, uh, 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 Grandpa, uh, Garth is about to devour me, and uh, could you please uh, uh, stop what you're doing and, 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 uh, and protect me? No, no, it's Papa, Papa, and she rushes and jumps up into my arms, and everything else has to And after a while, when everything's good, she'll come over and she'll say, Papa, and she'll walk over to the kitchen cupboard and she points up to one of the doors and she goes. I said, what's up there? She'll say, m and M. And I've told her grandmother, don't you ever let the supply be exhausted. God, you want to get in the refrigerator or whatever you want to, but you stay out of this cupboard up here, because I never intend to open that cupboard and find it empty and disappoint this little girl. That finger it has meaning. And that meaning is going to be satisfied as long as Grandpa can buy a sack of M&M's. You know, 
It's been perhaps 40 years since I've prayed for anything material. Most of you know me. I don't need anything. I'm driving a Lincoln Continental. I didn't pray for that. Blame Kenny Kerr for it. He called me and said, would you, or would you be interested in one? For the price of a Chevrolet? And I said, well, yes. I live in as fine a home as there is in the city of Downey. They were great for that. And maybe I'm just simple enough to believe, to believe my Heavenly Father. And there isn't a week goes by that Isaiah 65, 24 isn't fulfilled in my experience. What is it? And it shall come to pass there is a place that you can reach in your experience and your acquaintanceship with Almighty God, who holds the wealth of the world in his hand, who will withhold any good thing from his children. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will Jesus said, don't pray, don't waste your time praying for clothes and cars and homes. And I can't even listen to a, a, a Christian telecast anymore without hearing somebody quoting somebody's tape. To pray for things. Set your goal for things. Put the, your prayers together properly so you can get things. People, we're overbuilt to this world. There isn't enough things to satisfy a human heart. If, if, if things are going to make you happy and things are going to satisfy, they don't build homes beautiful enough, cars fast enough, clothes fancy enough, money uh, enough, to make you happy. Jesus said the man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of things which he possesses. But they're the people who commit suicide. Who try to accumulate all the things that they can. Right? You don't hear of poor people commit suicide. 